Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Worship Band Builder Podcast, where we are working with you to lay the foundation for skillful worship. I'm Eric Roberts, and this is my co-host, Emily Roberts. Hello! It's our first episode! Yay! Our first episode ever, and you're here with us, so we're excited about that. And we also have a couple other firsts. Our first Drums and Bass Foundation courses are launching today. Today? The day the podcast drops. Oh! Yay! I didn't tell her that before, so she didn't know. But if you are interested in drums and bass, you can go to the website worshipbandbuilder.com and you can click on drums and bass. And you will also, also save 10% on your order if you use code podcast. And I just blew her out of her seat. She's speechless. She doesn't know what to say. (laughs) (laughs) code podcast and today we're talking about how to make your job less stressful and more enjoyable yes we titled this one you can thank yourself later because everything we're telling you today all of these tips will make your job so much more enjoyable it will take all of the stress out of what you're doing yeah when being a worship leader or being in a band is can be very stressful. If you let it get ahead of you. Yeah, probably some of the most stressful moments of my life have been based around being a worship leader or being in a band or trying to perform or trying to learn songs. And sometimes I go, why am I doing this to myself? I could just be sitting on a beach somewhere <laughs> doing something. But um, we know why we're doing it. That's not what today's episode's about. But... We don't want to freak out and be so stressed out. So there are some things on our list that we can do this year. This is the beginning of the year, the beginning of 2020, that we can do to make our job easier. And I'm just going to start going down these. Uh, We'll talk about them. Plan way ahead. This is songs and band scheduling three to four months at a time. Three to four months. That sounds like a lot. Yeah, that sounds like an overachiever, a worship leader overachiever. <laughs> You're going to plan out three or four months in advance your set schedule and your band schedule or your songs. That's that's doable, but it's crazy. What do you think about that? Do you give that schedule out to your band members ahead of time so they can give you a heads up on whether they can be a part of that, if they can help when you need them to help? Yeah, I say... Yeah, and I think this is something that I learned uh, years ago when I was scheduling three to four months out. Actually, I started doing it when I was getting really um, organized, and it started. I started noticing it was actually easier to schedule three to four months out than it was to just schedule a month out and then kind of keep going a month and a month. The month goes by so fast. By the time you get your, you know, your schedule done, you think you're all finally done, you got that out of your head, it's a month later and you got people that you have to reschedule again. So we can talk a little bit about how you do it. Yeah, I would schedule three to four months out. I would use a spreadsheet. Now, this was before Planning Center, uh, and so I'm dating it way back. But I think Planning Center had just sort of come on the scene. But you could schedule people out three to four months. But I had rotating bands and a schedule that went out three to four months. And then like the song list can be scheduled out pretty far. And there's really a lot of reasons to do that, but you can also change it. So it's not like set in stone. So if you get your four month plan, uh, you know, who's playing in the band, you've got everybody kind of, yes, I'm going to play. And we can talk more about that in future episodes about how rotating bands and creating that kind of scenario. But the idea of for this, for today is that if you can get planned out three to four months in advance, then for those three to four months, things will run smoother and your stress levels will melt away. It will be, and people know what's going on. Yes. Letting everybody else in on what you're doing is crucial to making a cohesive team. And I think planning the songs out ahead of time makes good sense because you don't have to remember what you did last week. Planning at the last minute means you've probably already forgotten what you did last week. And then you have to remember, okay, what songs did we do? Because I don't want to repeat that. Um, What songs did we do two weeks ago? Because it might be too soon for this song or that song. You know, if you've planned those all out ahead of time, then you can put the songs in place and not worry about it anymore. 
Yeah. And, you know, if you plan ahead, there's a couple good things about planning ahead. One is the, and the people will know what's going on. So if you know your drum, if you know your drummer's schedule and he knows his work schedule, you know, if you're dealing with people who are saying, well, I only know my schedule every two weeks. I mean, th- this is people don't really work on Sunday either, really, do they? I mean, some people do. Sometimes. So so. Uh, depends on, yeah, I guess your job. You could work Sunday. A lot of people's kids have sports stuff on Sunday. Yeah, they do. That's true. So you, you really have to have a committed group and you have to say, this is the commitment you're making. And then we're planning out three to four months. The worst thing to do is be planning week to week or every two weeks. People that really are committed are going to not really know what's going on. Look, the, here, here's the thing. I would take three to four months on a spreadsheet. I would put the bands and I would rotate the bands. I would give them their kind of their, this is the, this is what's happening. Along with that, I would give them the set list that were sort of in a draft mode, but they were like pretty much 85% done. And they would be all the way out for four months. So you can plan, we're, we're introducing this new song. You can plan, we're you know, doing these extra practices. Or we can plan around these holidays where our practice is changing. All of that's ahead of time. So these people know it. So three to four months out in a draft form, but is 85% complete, is really you know perfection. Because you can fill in then each week or each couple of weeks, you can just fill in those things. The other thing for the band is they can be practicing the songs for months in advance. And yes. that, that's really a key to, to, to making it less stressful. For but, them and for you. Yeah. And really as a worship leader, for me, it was just, it became just a, maybe more of a selfish thing. I mean, it helped the whole team, but it was about me. It wasn't about the team. Really, uh, it does help the team. But for me, I just knew after literally a couple hours on a Monday morning, I could have four months planned. And then that was my infrastructure that I could put that aside instead of just frantically always trying to plan. It was about it was about me. It was about me being confident, knowing what's coming. And then the, the band liked it too. And when you have to change, you have to change but you are planning way in advance. Okay, so the next one on here says play in the zone. What do you mean by that? Play in the zone. Well, pick songs that you can play. So it doesn't matter what level of player you are, if you're a very beginner and you have a small, you know, very beginning team, or if you're, you know, a highly, highly professional player and you're playing with highly professional people, or you could be a highly professional player playing with a lot of beginners, <laughs> whatever it is, it's your job kind of as the director, worship leader, uh, volunteer, whatever you are to know what your zone is, to know what is going to be successful. So if you don't have a really strong electric player, don't pick a lot of really strong electric lead guitar songs from Lincoln Brewster. Uh, you know, and his stuff, his newer stuff isn't so like that, but the older stuff was. So you have to be real careful in picking your songs and arranging them to be in a zone that makes you successful. I think that's probably one of the biggest hangups when you're getting started mm-hmm. or even as you're going is trying to do more than you can because right. that's going to be stressful. And it- it's... It frustrates the whole band when when you have a song that not everybody is at that playing level. Um, it reminds me of when I used to go to holiday dinners at my grandmother's house, and she would say, now grandma doesn't care what you take as long as you eat everything on your plate. <laughs> right. You know, and that's kind of what we do is we, we get these grand visions of, of what we think we want, but then we really can't finish the plate. Right. And I've done that before. I mean, I've had, uh, in my, as I was growing one of my bands once I would, I would hear a song and I would just think, this is it. This is the song. Mm -hmm. And then about halfway through practice, I would just shut it down and be like, we're not doing this song. This song's going to wait. I mean, you're, you're constantly pushing the zone or at least I was, but, um, sometimes you push that zone too far and you go, okay, this just isn't, this doesn't sound like I want it to. And I don't think it's going to sound like it for now. So we're going to scrap the song. That's okay too. When you're, when you're trying to find your zone, it's okay to test it out. And it's, and you're going to have to, especially if you take on a new church or if you're starting a new band and you're getting new volunteers, they may 
surprise you and be able to play really well some hard stuff, even different styles like country or gospel or, you know, more rock, modern stuff. It's, it, your guys and your girls on the band, they're going to have a, a, a talent level to certain styles as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that song I was trying to do was an Amy Grant song and it had more of a country vibe to it, but our band was very much more like Tomlin rock band and it just sounded terrible. So I was like, no, we're not doing this song, but I wanted to do it bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but I didn't. And it was better for the whole band and the church. So, so far we've done uh, Plan Way Ahead, Play in the Zone, and next on the list is Focus on Your Strengths and Delegate the Things You're Not Good At. Oh, yeah. That's a tough one. Delegation is really hard to learn. And finding your figuring out what you're good at is also, I think, hard to learn. Mm. If you're going to be a good leader, though, I think you have to really be able to kind of put down your pride. You know, we're, we're in this to be as good as we can and to do as good of a job as we can. And we're as leaders, we're kind of people are looking at us, you know, at least in my experience, once you are become the leader, then people are kind of looking at the whole program. And it's sort of like mm -hmm. this is because, say, Eric is doing this is this is good because he's doing good or this is bad because he's doing bad. So you, you ha kind of have to learn to gauge that. Where, what am I really good at? Because um, if you're not good at scheduling three to four months ahead, but you know you need to, then find somebody who's, somebody out there is really, really obsessed with scheduling way ahead. And yes. they, you know, they're just different people. I'm, and I'm not like that. people want to help. They're looking for an opportunity to be a part of the worship team. So that could be somebody who's not even... A, a musician per se, but they have uh, a love of music, man, they could help you line up your musicians and take care of that piece of it for you. And that would be one weight off of your shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. You want to really get to a place where you're confident as a leader, you know, who's around you. And that's kind of like focusing on your strengths if you're a great arranger, then arrange, you know, maybe you, maybe that's one thing you hold close to the vest. You don't let a lot of people come and arrange your music, but then if you're really not great at, you know, running rehearsals or, um, running sound or things like that, find people scheduling, find people to do these things, um, and delegate them. Delegating is really probably the only way to really grow your ministry as a whole overall, because people, like you said, they're going to get involved. Then they're going to feel like I'm a part of this and they'll Absolutely. start investing really time. They'll invest time. They'll invest money. They'll invest instruments. They'll invest all of the things that you need to grow your ministry if they feel a part of the ministry. I think that a lot of us get stuck in that. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself mindset. Uh, but truly, I think... Uh, my degree is in teaching and one of the most important things that I, most important pieces of advice I think that anybody ever gave me was just to say, you don't always have to have the answer. It's okay to say, I don't know, but let's look it up together. Now that's a teaching example, but for, for worship, you can say, I'm not really comfortable with this soundboard, but I know who is. And you go to them for that, for that piece of it. Right. Yeah. So maybe instead of, you know, some people are really good at what they're good at. I was talking to one of my friends today. I'm like, you're, you're good at telling people that you're good at this. And, you know, and I, I'm pretty good at that too. You know, you're, you're good at telling you're good people at telling that people. you're good at things. Yeah. You're good at telling people you're good at things. And I was just kind of teasing him because we've kind of like, it's always kind of been like a joke between us and, and, uh, you know, every guitar player has an ego, you know, so it's like a get to, we were talking about guitar and it was like, well, you're always, you're, you're, you're always good at telling everybody how good you are at guitar. So that's just kind of uh, the way guitar players are, you know, they're really fast to tell you like, look at all I can do. Um, but maybe if you're good at that, just write down your strengths or what's better on the list here is eliminate your worry by making a list of your weaknesses instead. So write down some things that you hate and really your weakness is like, for me, it's like taxes, you know, doing the, ta doing all the paperwork. That's like, I'm a creative person. So yeah, I want to like play with the soundboard. But then if you tell me to like go do the taxes, I'm like, I'm not really good at that because I don't want to do it. So, um, write down what you're not good at. You know what you're not good at because you pretty much don't want to do it. 
And when you do it, it's just okay. So I, w- <laughs> I would say write down the list of your weaknesses and then try to make those stronger, but then try to find people that are, you know, the point that is you, you don't plug have to, in. Yeah. The point is you don't have to do it all yourself. You're good at some things, but you're not good at all things. I mean, I think as a worship leader and as a leader in general, if we can admit to our own selves, like we stink at this <laughs> and we can know that that's okay, then maybe we'll be okay uh, delegating that to people. And I've, I've always done that. There is something you said earlier, you know, if you want it done right, do it yourself. There are some things in your ministry that, that you're going to know that if I want this done, because I, I do have that problem a bit. If you want it done, do it yourself. And mm-hmm. I'm a doer. I'm a self-doer. I do everything. I try to do everything myself, and I'll figure it out. But in ministry, there's a lot of times when you're like, no, I'm going to have these people do these things. Some of these things you're only going to want to do yourself, and you're going to know that if I do this part, it's going to be the best. I'm the best person to do this part. That's okay. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they hired you for a reason. Yeah, so do your part, do your best, and then find other people that you know to fill in the gaps. Um, so let's talk about vision. I mean, we're talking a lot about planning out and trying to find strength and weaknesses. One thing I think that kind of brings us all together is vision when you're around a team. What kind of vision should a worship leader have? Are we talking about uh, goals for the future, maybe building a bigger band, or maybe it's that challenging song that you're trying to reach? What are we talking about as a vision for the worship team? Well, I'm so, on the paper here, it says verbalize your vision to the team. And what I'm thinking is if you do have a vision, if you write it out three to four months, that's a vision. Uh, you know, here's the songs okay. that we're going to do. This is a vision for the team. Uh, if, you are, if you are saying, I'm not good at this, but I envision a team that's strong, so we're going to have other people plug in. So you're verbalizing the whole vision. Like you, if you say like, we're going to have the best sounding worship band and we're going to have the tightest band and we're going to also have this, you know, really, um, large worship ministry where all these people are involved, you're giving vision, but you're not, you're not going to be able to do it all yourself. So you're opening the door too. So I think Mm -hmm. as you're putting together these plans and as you're focusing on your strengths and doing all this, you're, you're also communicating a vision, a greater vision, other than, hey, I'm, I'm Eric, I'm here to lead worship, and I'm just going to make this happen for everybody, and then just everybody follow me, and we'll, this will be fine. Mm-hmm. That's one way that we can do ministry, and that's um, I've done ministry like that before, where it's like, I'm here, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to just play, and everybody's just falling behind, and we'll just make this happen, and we'll just kind of get by. Mm-hmm. That's one way of doing it. But when you are talking about uh, verbalizing your vision, in all of these things we're doing, we're verbalizing per se, a vision to them that we are, okay. we are, we are in deeper, we are in together, we are building our wink, yeah, building our strengths and weaknesses together, and we're going to fill in the gaps. So I think maybe one piece of that would be the structure of your practices. Everybody, if everybody knows that we show up 10 minutes early to make sure that our instruments are plugged in, tuned up, you know, microphones are in place. That would be a miracle. All of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, We get together and pray before we start. If there's a routine, if there's an expectation, that could be part of the vision, couldn't it? Yeah, I think that's part of setting that whole thing, that setting that team vision. Uh, may, the whole po- the whole point of this is to make your job easier, so and, and less stressful. Is it stressful when everybody shows up ten minutes late and then the sound guy doesn't come to practice? None of that. None of those scenarios have ever felt stressless to me. That that's stressless. always stressless. That's stressless. They've all felt like full of stress and anxiety, especially like Sunday morning because nobody showed up for practice or half the pre- people practiced and half didn't. To me, as a worship leader, that is, that's why I'm talking about, you know, I would rather just go to the beach and just forget this <laughs> because you get in these moments where you didn't plan ahead. You didn't have a vision. You didn't have a set time. You know, we really, um, you know, want everybody here. You didn't have that. So you live under this. Is this going to, are we going to pull this off? I mean, are we going to, is this going to sound all right in 30 minutes when church starts? You, you don't want to be in that position. The only way to get out of that position is to go back to that morning where you're planning out four months, where you're filling in the weaknesses, where you're getting more volunteers. So and, when we say verbalize your vision, we're really talking about making your expectations clear. Yeah. To you and to the team 
and setting up a framework that actually works so that when you're standing up there at 9.59 and the countdown clock is at, you know, one minute, you know I've got this. You know my strongest players are in, in play. You know um, we've known about this set list for weeks or months. You you have fun. And I, I got to that place in my ministry at one time where everybody was sort of in place. And that, that this is really where a lot of these techniques that we're going to be talking about over the next year on the Worship Band Builder podcast come from, come from real life experiences where, yeah, I've been the worship leader where the countdown's at, at one minute or we can't even get the countdown on because, you know, we weren't there in time and we're just kind of going, you know, flying by the seat of our mm-hmm. pants and hoping it goes well. And then I've been in a scenario where we know all of everything's there and we've we've practiced and our best players are in play. And that's when there is no stress. That's when it became fun. That's when worship leading and church band building became fun for me. And that's when everybody else is having fun. That's when um, everybody wants to play every week. They're so excited to be there. They're confident and they know that they sound good together. Um, That's a good place to be. You said something um, about making the vision clear even to yourself. And that's um, a point too, that sometimes our our vision for our team can be unrealistic and we have to be able to check and balance that. We can't say everybody show up 10 minutes until six if we know that one of our band members doesn't get off work until six o'clock and they got to, um, you know, run home and grab their base or whatever it is. Um, that's not a realist, real, hmm, realistic expectation for your band as a whole. So um, knowing what you want and fitting that to your team um, takes a little bit of work. Yeah, it can take, it takes a lot of work and it also can create a lot of stress, like I say friction in your own life and in their life. And as a leader, if you're committed to that church and to those people, then you have to be able to, and we'll be talking about this in future podcasts, but you have to be able to work with that team, cast that vision, and pull them on. I know I remember times when I've asked my drummer, hey, I need you to be here for you know three weeks a month. And he's kind of like, I don't know if I can do this and, you know, pray about it. And really, this is the vision of the team. This is the teams that we're building. This is how we're going to be rotating. And so you're you're not just working by yourself, like everybody has to do what you say, but as a real leader with less stress, you're, you're looking at each one of those guys and girls as a part of the greater team. And they do, yeah, they do have kids, they have everything. So the fiction, the, the verbalizing the vision helps remove the friction, but it happens over time. So, you know, one of the biggest stresses probably that I've I've felt uh, that I listen to worship leaders and pastors all over the United States say they they don't have enough musicians to fill the stage, or they just can't get enough people to play. So if that is what we're talking about, instead of hey, we have so many musicians, we're rotating. I mean, if you feel that, you're like feel good about yourself. But a lot of you are saying, hey, I can't find enough drummers, or we only have one drummer, and he can only play every other week. And that's what Worship Band Builders Foundations courses are all about. And so as we close out today, we'll talk about that a little bit, how you can actually take people out of the pews, get them on the stage, playing with you, integrating them into your team, giving them foundational training that makes it them know, hey, I can do this. I can live up to the expectations of the worship leader and the band. And you got to know, there are people out there right now in your pew that are going, I wish I could play the bass or I want to play the drums. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we just released this week, just today, we're dropping the Drums and Bass Foundations courses, so you can check those out on our website today at worshipbandbuilder.com, and it will help you uh, systematically build more musicians in your team. You can also save 10% if you use code PODCAST. So this is our final tip, is getting people out of the pews and onto the stage, because that seems to be a common Uh, stress factor for worship leaders is, you know, I'm always hunting for somebody who can play the bass. I've got one guy, and if he doesn't show up, then I'm scrambling. Um, 
Our program is so simple and it's so affordable. And if it's not affordable to you, we find a way to make it affordable because we want you to have musicians um, and we, we want you to succeed. This is, this is worship to the Lord and um, it should be an honor and a privilege and not um, a point of anxiety. So if we can help you do that, uh, find our website, like Eric said, uh, worshipbandbuilder.com. And uh, even talk to us. Give us a call. We can help you with any of this. Yeah, it's pretty easy right there on the website. If you're listening to this for the first time, maybe you're just getting to know us. Uh, there is a there is a place right there you can ask for one-on-one help. So that's actually just a conversation with me on the phone. And uh, you can also ask for financial assistance through our Unite program where we have uh, people who are donating to help smaller churches because, you know, right now that, that is a problem. You're a small church. Maybe you need instruments, you need budget, you need musicians, and training uh, could that, that, that affordable price that we think is affordable to your small church may just be out of the limits of your mind to be able to afford that. And when that happens, just let us know. We have uh, people who are willing to donate those uh, training ministry training tools to you. And, you know, really, it's all about starting the journey, thinking to yourself, I know what I want. I want, if you're a pastor, a worship leader, I want a stress-free worship environment where people can meet God, they can they can come in, and when they leave, they can feel like they've, they've been changed, they've worshiped, they've used, they've made that expression through music. And in order to do that, we have to do there is a lot that leads up to that. You don't just willy-nilly walk up to the stage and throw on a track and then, and then it just happens. You, there's a lot of planning. And if you're listening this far into this podcast today, I believe that you are called and you are developing talent in yourself or in your church. And that's the thing you have to remember is you're called to do this and that God is giving you and will give you the strength to do it if you just press in and do the right things, plan ahead. Um, nothing just happens, you know, just maybe when you meet that one you love, you see him for the first time, <laughs> things just happen. But, you know, when you're talking about... You look about, across the table into your microphone. And yes, and you say, this, <laughs> this has got to be the one. But that's what we have today. So we thank you for uh, joining us in the Worship Band podcast. And we'd like you to take a moment just to share this, to hit the like button if you're listening on YouTube. Now you can listen to the podcast anywhere you can get your podcast, also on YouTube and any other platform in the entire universe. What a great world we live in today. God bless you guys.